Hello, welcome to Bibliophiles, the show on AADL TV, where we take a few moments each episode to discuss one book topic. Uh, my name is Amanda, and I am joined by Christopher and Lucy, as always. And in this episode, we are discussing books that were written by Native American authors. And I am very excited to see what you both pick, because as you all may know, we don't tell each other ahead of time what our choices are. So, Lucy, what book did you bring to share today? So the book that I chose for an Indigenous author was um, The Lost Journals of Sacagawea. And this is by Deborah Magpie Erling, who is Bitterroot Salish. And this is sort of the story of Sacagawea in a way. It's like the author took the bare bones of Sacagawea's story and invented this really rich inner monologue for Sacagawea because we she's only mentioned... I think twice in Lewis and Clark's entire, you know, um, writing about their expedition. And obviously she lived much more of a life than that. So what Erling is doing here is sort of making this the story of Sacagawea's own, own story about her discovery and changing the narrative because, and there's nothing really, there was nothing about her. So she really had to kind of, infuse a lot of what she imagined it might be like. Um, one thing that she did in this book that was really interesting is she used punctuation and um, language in a, in a very interesting way. She would sort of like make words fade out or grayish words. Those were usually words that were th things that were sacred to Sacagawea, which those words she wouldn't have said out loud, but other people did say out loud. Um, punctuation is is very different and it the flow takes a little bit to get used to but the author has a really nice note in the beginning explaining why she's doing this and you get used to it and you really get I got really got pulled in by Sacagawea's voice because this author is her language is so poetic and she's such a great writer um and it's an interesting challenge if you think about it to write a story in the language of your colonizers like that's you know kind of what deborah uh erling was struggling with so she really just sort of invented this new way of sacagawea speaking and you're not always sure with a capitalized noun if someone is a dead you know like living or a dead relative or a spirit or an animal but or a combination of those things um but it doesn't really matter what you think because it's really about who that character is to Sacagawea. And I learned a lot from this book about just the the presence of, you know, ancestors who have passed on, but they're still really there and they're still really alive. Um, it's hard to, to sort of describe this book. Um, it's not really like anything I've read. I just really enjoyed reading it. I think it was an important book to write because, you know, it's, it's centering this story on a woman who was very important in the story. And it doesn't even start, it starts when Sacagawea, Sacagawea was younger, when she is living in her tribe of origin, um, which was the Shoshone tribe before she was abducted by the um, by another tribe. And then it, it goes on through there. But uh, one, I just want to read one quote from the author. And then uh, she said the truth of her story. It was so haunting. This woman endured so much suffering in her life. So that was what called to me. I recognize that I recognize the Hidatsa and Lemzi Shoshani both claim her and have stories of her as well as different spellings of her name. The history of her in some ways is a believed history on all sides. It's as if she were many things, and that's really interesting. And then she goes on to talk about how she's so ingrained in the mythology of the soul of the West, the story of the West. It's almost like the story has been created for our own comfort. You know, uh, Sacagawea probably wasn't married to the person that they say she was married to. She was really probably more enslaved. And, you know, I think the author imagined she was younger than she was. So there's a lot. Um, she really did a lot to um, give a voice and a sense of self-discovery and a lot of strength to not only Sacagawea, but also her family members and other women um, that are around her in different scenarios. And the author did say that she believes that Sacagawea was the first stolen sister. 
So um, that is the Lost Journals of Sacagawea by Deborah Magpie Erling. And it was an unusual read, but one that I highly recommend. Christopher, what did you bring? Well, it sounds really interesting, Lucy. The book I read is And Then She Fell by Alicia Elliott. I haven't been this excited about a book in quite a while. I really, really enjoyed this. It brings in a lot of ideas of cultural appropriation. And one of my favorite themes throughout the book is storytelling. So it's it's a wonderful book. It centers on Alice, a, a woman, a Mohawk woman who is married to a white academic and they live in Toronto and have a newborn baby. Uh, Alice starts to have a lot of visions, maybe they're hallucinations, and they're all culminating as she prepares to go to this academic dinner. So it is it leaves the reader wondering whether Alice is having these hallucinations or whether it's really happening. And suddenly the story shifts for the last 70 pages. There's a, a shift in point of view and storytelling, and you get this other kind of larger view of life where the characters are now choosing their own lives from a range of different choices, and they get to see the outcomes of all their choices. And they're also choosing the lives of their ancestors. Would it have been better if I had never been born? You know, what kinds of choices that my ancestors make would leave would lead to me not even being here for better or worse? So it's a sprawling, wonderful book. I, I really got into it. Um, the title of the book refers to the story that Alice is telling in the plot. So Alice is retelling the story of Mature Flowers, which is a creation story. And the title then refers to that. So I, I really, really enjoyed it. And I especially appreciated her critique of a lot of Western culture and of academia, where people really are appropriating language and stories and culture, really without regard to where they came from. So that is And Then She Fell by Alicia Elliott. Amanda, what did you read? Well, both of those books do sound interesting. I chose a book that's a bit different as well. The book I chose for today is called Night of the Living Res, written by Morgan Talty. The book was published in 2022. And this author, he was actually one of the 535 in 2023. And that was a topic that bibliophiles discussed earlier this year was 535. Um, so, and I read this last year. So when I saw him on the list um, the year later, I thought that was really cool um, because he is a very skilled writer. He is a citizen of the Penobscot Indian nation. And this was his debut work. And it, all oh, this book, it just, it punches you in the gut and then it gives you a hug. It is so complicated and wonderful. It's a collection of short stories. Um, but they are told, they're interconnected and they are non-linear. So really you could read the book, read just each individual story, or you could read it as a collected work. To me, it reads like a novel out of order. And I do recommend reading it um, in its entirety because it's a really fast read. And since it's interconnected, you really get to spend a lot of time with some of these characters and the characters it's their, what they're experiencing, but it's the characters that are the root of the story and everything that they're feeling and what they're doing in the in the stories. So the main one of the main characters that floats through all of the stories is David. And you see it starts, the first story starts when David is six years old and he finds a jar under his house's porch of like hair and teeth. And his mom's boyfriend finds it and they need to get out of the house. It's bad medicine because they think it's gonna curse them. And inevitably they think it ends up cursing them. 
but the book doesn't have any it only has that sort of tone throughout it very lightly but for them that's just a natural part of their daily life and so they think that, that something's wrong anyways that's just one of the stories so he's six when it starts and since it's non-linear you kind of follow david through different points in his life and you see different members of his family he lives with his mother and his older sister Paige, and she's sort of in and out of the house um the mom has a long-term ish boyfriend named frick uh, he spends a lot of time with his friend fellas and there's a couple other friends that are mentioned fellas has a, a mom that he lives with and for part of the time david lives with fellas and his mom um, so it's just this complicated mishmash of different moments in David's life, painting this larger picture of, um, his family and his community. Um, the themes are like, there's grief, there's pain, there's addiction, mental illness. Um, his grandma has dementia. That was a really good, uh, story. So it's about this complicated family structure. Um, one of the stories, David and his friend Fellis are kind of like these bumbling buddies and they decide they're going to rob the tribal museum of some artifacts because they were inspired by antiques roadshow um one in one of the stories david finds his friend fellas like passed out in the woods and it's winter so his hair his long hair is like frozen to the ground he's got to like cut off his hair which is a big deal um the story where grandma or where david goes to visit his grandmother while she has dementia as a young boy the grandmother's brother apparently died when he was 12 and so with the grandma having dementia when david goes there she thinks that he's her brother and she has him smoke a bunch of cigarettes and he goes home when he's sick and then his sister takes care of him so it's just these little bits and moments of this this boy and young man and adult's life um during present day um where they live it's the stories aren't always super pleasant to read but there's something riveting about it it's sort of unsettling but you keep reading because you don't know where it's going to go since the stories are, are non-linear, you don't know what point in David's life you're going to see him next. And things that happened earlier, there's always these interconnected pieces between what, what his friend is up to, what his mom is up to, where is his sister, um, what unexpected things keep happening. And you just get sucked in and pulled in. I read the book for the first time last summer and then getting ready for this, I reread, <clears throat> pardon me, like three quarters of it yesterday because it's such a quick read. It's just over 200 pages. Yeah, 260 pages. So it's just a really, it's a really, really good read. And this author, the, the main thing is his writing. The way he writes these, these short stories, you just, you feel like you're right there. You are with David in the middle of the woods. You are in his room. You are like, you're with him the whole time. And it's just, it's really deep. It's really engrossing. And I just, really phenomenal. The author did put out a new book. It's a novel at, that came out earlier this year. I haven't read it yet. Um, but I hope it's, I hope, I'm sure the writing is as good, but I hope it's as good as this one. Cause this one just really knocked me, just knocked me over. I thought it was just, just a really, really solid read. And I just, I love how many collections of short stories that I found over the past few years, um, to talk about with this discussion group, as well as some of the others at the library. And this one, just the format of it being nonlinear and you stay with these characters, um, interconnected short stories just might be my, my new jam because they just they're so unique and it takes a special kind of a craft um, to be able to pull that out of words on a page and make it so meaningful. Um, yeah. So that is night of the living res by Morgan Talty. Does anybody have any final thoughts or anything else they want to share? All right. Well, that is this episode um, discussing native American authors. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any recommendations of native American authors you've read or would recommend or any books you want to recommend or talk about with us, we would love to hear it. Feel free to click the link below and you can drop a comment over on the library's website. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time.